orcs, those creatures of darkness. Today we are going to look at everything that we know about those servants of the Dark Lords. Build me a army worthy of Six years of intergalactic battles, legendary alliances and the ultimate showdown between good and evil. Marvel Strike Force celebrates its 6th anniversary with a cosmic bash and you're invited to join the heroes and villains in a quest to save the universe against threats like Doctor Doom and Apocalypse. Dive into the Mobile Squad RPG that captivated millions, where the fate of the universe rests in your hands. Command a team of Marvel icons like Iron Man, Wolverine, Venom and more in stunning visual combat. Whether you're strategizing in alliance wars or dominating the real-time arena, power up your characters, unlock gear, and claim victory in a universe that's constantly evolving. The celebration is in full swing with reasons galore to join the fight. New and veteran players alike can look forward to these exclusive anniversary rewards. Generous gifts. Log in now to snag character shards, an anniversary diamond orb, and more to boost your squad. 2,190 days of Marvel Strike Force events. Complete milestones for gold, training items, and the coveted Nick Fury costume, as well as weekly anniversary prizes. Earn unique items each week to commemorate six years of thrilling Marvel action. Be part of the ultimate celebration by installing Marvel Strike Force today. Join forces with millions in epic battles and events. The universe needs you. The party won't be the same without you. Unlock your superhero potential with these exclusive promo codes. New users enter MSF6 to receive 310 Deadpool shards, 500 power cores, and 5 premium orbs. Returning players, we've got you covered too with Knight for 50 Nightcrawler shards, 500 power cores, and 5 premium orbs. So, simply visit the link on screen or in the description to redeem and join the Anniversary Bash. If there is one question in the Tolkien Legendarian that seems less than obvious, and maybe even perhaps a bit painful, it is the question of the origin of the Orcs. If we rewind time to many, many years ago, we learn that the Silmarillion was once captured within a framing device, wherein the story was being told by the elves to a human, Alfwine. Alfwine being an Anglo-Saxon man living in the 10th century in Britain who somehow ended up on Aresia after taking directions from a mysterious old man. This framing device was a way Tolkien planned to introduce the lore of the elves in a way that made it possible for the Lord of the Rings and the Legendarium to represent an earlier, pre-Christian stage of our world, all as a story within a story, or a framing device. So you see. In the early days, this was how he answered the question, where does all the lore of the Eldar come from? In the beginning, the Silmarillion was a bunch of lore collected by the elves on their history. But with the removal of the frame, it became more scriptural, which the published Silmarillion maintains. That is, the voice of authoritative writing. The transmission was of Rumil, one of the more knowledgeable lore masters of the Noldor. This is the revised preamble. Here begins the annals of a man. Rumil made them in the Alder days, and they were held in memory by the exiles. Those parts which we learned and remembered were thus set down in Numenor before the shadow fell upon it. As documents being transmitted by way of translation, via Bilbo handing it down to Frodo with the framing device of an elf speaking to a human, gives a lot of context to some of the problems maintained in the published Silmarillion, which is that of one, understanding who is speaking, and two, how their perspective influences the tale. Elfwine was a human who had visited the elves and had brought back this material as a link not to the Third Age, but to the stories of Valinor and our world. He was the transmitter of these stories into human history, as we learn from Morgoth's Ring. Even later in the first draft of Many Partings, we see Bilbo giving Sam these translations of the stories from the Elvish before it was revised to be that of a vintage, should he ever get married. So the impulse for the frame was still there, even in the later stages of writing of The Lord of the Rings. So when that frame of subjectivity is removed, the problems become more difficult. And so with all of this, 
we now get on to the question of the Orcs. Now this question, to be perfectly honest with you all straight out of the gate, has maybe no good answer, because the implications for what we have are quite terrifying. From the Silmarillion that we got, Orcs would come from the Elves that were perverted, corrupted into the form of horror and servitude to Morgoth. Which is a problem, really, because this makes them unwilling servants and on top of that, victimises them, when they are changed beyond recognition, mutilated, perverted by Morgoth to be a mockery of the firstborn children of Eru Iluvatar. This answer gives us no end of moral problems, the first being that of choice. The orcs as presented thusly had no choice in their allegiance, which makes their wholesale slaughter more of a tragedy than a victory. This is the problem which troubled the great professor, as we see in Tolkien's later letters on the orcs he would redress this first origin, given to us in the published Silmarillion, and what the struggle comes down to is whether or not orcs have individual souls, or if they are sentient beings capable of redemption. This was really important to the professor and a question that gave him no end of trouble. We have the early version of the Silmarillion now, published in The Book of the Lost Tales Part 2, when Malkor was still Malko, and yet we see him breeding the creatures from stone. For all that the race were bred by Malko of the subterranean heats and slime. Their hearts were of granite and their bodies deformed. Foul their faces which smiled not, but their laugh that of the clash of metal, and to nothing were they more fain than to aid in the basest of the purposes of Marco. While this is less perverse, perhaps, than them being the perversion of the race of the elves, and thus unwitting slaves of the Dark Lord, Professor Tolkien wasn't happy with this origin story either, though his revisions still placed their creations in the designs of Malco. But of those unhappy ones who were ensnared by Malkor little is known of a certainty. For who of those living has descended into the pits of Utumna, or has explored the darkness of the councils of Malkor? Yet this is held true by the wise of Eresia, that all those of the Quendi who came into the hands of Malkor ere Utumna was broken were put there in prison, and by slow arts of cruelty were corrupted and enslaved. And thus did Malkor breed the hideous race of the orcs in envy and mockery of the elves, of whom they were afterwards the bitterest foes. For the orcs had life and multiplied after the manner of the children of Iluvatar, and nought that had life of its own, nor the semblance of life, could ever Malkor make since his rebellion in the Ainulindale before the beginning, so says the wise. And deep in the dark hearts the orcs loathed the master whom they served in fear, the maker only of their misery. This it may be was the vilest deed of Malkor, and the most hateful of Iluvatar. Despite this wrangling and questioning of the origins, it is more about the power of creation, and whether or not Malkor could truly create a lifeform with a soul. In 1954, Tolkien wrote a letter which stated that orcs were fundamentally a race of rational incarnate creatures, though horribly corrupted, if no more so than many men to be met today. Later in that same letter too, he quotes his own story of the Lord of the Rings, saying, Suffering and experience, and possibly the ring itself gave Frodo more insight, and you will read in chapter 1 of book 6 the words to Sam, The shadow that bred them can only mock, it cannot make real new things of its own. I don't think it gave life to orcs, it only ruined them and twisted them. In the legends of the Alder days, it is suggested that the Diabolus subjugated and corrupted some of the earliest elves, before they had ever heard of the gods, let alone of God. A lot of this philosophical wrangling comes down to Tolkien's own wishes when he came to rewriting the Silmarillion after the publication of The Lord of the Rings, which he intended to have published as one long saga of the jewels and the ring. The problem was he had no publishers willing to take this massive project on, and the long letter we get that explained the Silmarillion's connection to The Lord of the Rings is really a pitch letter to a potential publisher after Tolkien had walked away from his original one 
when they refused to publish the books in conjunction with one another. Then, when the publisher he tried to talk to in the publishings of both also refused, he returned, 10 years past the deadline, to his original publisher. And also here, if you would actually like to see a video in the future on the early Silmarillion with what it used to be and some of the biggest changes made, then please leave me a comment of the original Silmarillion down below. But anyway, this stubbornness of Professor Tolkien is one of the reasons that the Silmarillion was not published in his lifetime, and the continued revisions of the material after the marriage of the early mythology to the later stories of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. This would lead the Professor creating and getting lost in these philosophical speculations. As Christopher Tolkien tells us in the foreword of Morgoth's Ring, the history of Middle-earth volume 10 that is, what his father needed, we are told, was a consistent world, and in some ways he was unable to make that work so that it proved satisfactory in every way for the Professor. The problem of the Orcs and their origins is one of the larger issues he had when reworking the early mythology, such as the Book of Lost Tales and the Annals of a Man, which we would later get in the Quenta Silmarillion. With the removal of the framing device, of the book being a translation from the Alvish Hand going from Bilbo to Frodo, a lot of the perspective of what the Silmarillion as it was changed dramatically. Later in life, Christopher Tolkien would admit to making some mistakes in his wholesale removal of the framing device, which would give some when it comes to the inconsistencies. As a translation from earlier documents, inconsistencies are bound to crop up, but as a document that is authoritative and in the mode of scripture, it is all the more condemning when it speaks on the orcs as being corrupted elves snatched from their land of awakening in Cuivierne. So, the origins remained in flux, evolving from the creation by Malkor from stone, from elves in the published The Silmarillion, though in his later life and towards his death, we got different answers still, this time looking at Morgoth's ring again. But even before this wickedness of Morgoth was suspected, the wise in the elder days taught always that the orcs were not made by Malkor, and therefore were not in their origin evil. They might have become irredeemable, at least by elves and men, but they remained within the law. Here he could be referring to the law as the later document of the laws and customs of the Eldar. Tolkien thought deeply and painstakingly about the philosophical precepts his book presented. Later, Malkor would go on to further corrupt other creatures, and even Sauron as well. The trolls, Treebeard tells us, were mockeries of the Ents, and Sauron's breeding would produce the Black Uruks which could withstand the sunlight unlike the others bred by Morgoth in Angband. It really does hint there was more to corrupting things than just the creation of Orcs. So there we have it, a look into the ideas of where the Orcs first came from. Whether from the corruption and manipulation of a people or of stone, they are hideous and terrifying creatures, which may be redeemable or not, but either way it appears that they were always destined to live a life barely worth living. It can be said Tolkien intended only that they were not fundamentally a perversion, a corruption, or species to be treated with the righteous slaughter at all times which means that throughout his life, the Professor gave thought and respect to the vilest of his creation, and in the end reasoned that they too were capable of redemption, of love, pity, and he leaves room for their redemption, despite all the material we have kind of saying otherwise. It might therefore be incorrect to suggest that what we have in the published The Silmarillion and in the later letters can give us a definitive answer and that it is more like to judge an individual based on their actions rather than the manner of their creation. This is a lesson that belongs to all times though, you could say, not just ours. That the worst amongst us can find redemption, and that this may be the last, yet the greatest lesson taught to us by the late Professor J.R.R. Tolkien. Goblins Orcs Uruk Kai, Goblin Men, Half Orcs, Hobgoblins. These are some of the several names given to the minions of the forces of evil that served under the Dark Lords of Middle Earth of both Morgoth and Sauron. A big question we always get is about these creatures, and that is, what is the difference between them all? Are they completely different creatures? Or are they just different breeds of the same creature? Or even just different names for exactly the same thing? 
so today we thought we'd have a look at the main ones of these and try and figure that out. Now let's start off with the most common of these, the Orc. I won't go into full detail of their origins in this video, but to sum it up quickly. In the Silmarillion, it talks about how the Orcs were bred by Malkor in Chapter 9 of The Flight of the Noldor, where it says, There he delved anew his vast vaults and dungeons, and above their gates he reared the threefold peaks of Thangorodrim, and a great reek of dark smoke was ever wreathed about them. There, countless became the hosts of his beasts and his demons, and the race of Orcs bred long before grew and multiplied in the bowels of the earth. It is said that these creatures were brought into being by corrupting some of the first elves that had ever lived, twisting them into these hideous creatures. In the end, the orcs ended up smaller than the average height of a man or elf, most likely similar sizes to that of a dwarf. Although their overall appearance would vary, in general they would have long arms and fanged mouths but this gives a pretty good idea of just what an orc is. So now we move on to the goblins, and let's start off with this passage from The Hobbit. Now goblins are cruel, wicked, and bad-hearted. They make no beautiful things, but they make many clever ones. They can tunnel and mine as well as but the most skilled dwarves when they take the trouble, though they are usually untidy and dirty. Hammers, axes, swords, Daggers, pickaxes, tongs, and also instruments of torture they make very well, or get other people to make to their design. Prisoners and slaves that have to work till they die for want of air and light. As you can see, these are horrible creatures, but as for how they may be different, this one may be unexpected to some. The term goblin is actually considered the same and therefore interchangeable with those referred to as orcs. The term goblin was predominantly used in The Hobbit, and occasionally in The Lord of the Rings, however by that point it was mainly Orc that was the one used. Now of course it is probably worth mentioning about the Peter Jackson adaptations when it comes to goblins, as for those of us who grew up on the movies might actually get confused and assume that those from Moria are goblins, and those from Mordor are Orcs, and therefore different for example. But this is not quite the case. Realistically, they are the same, and this was more of an artistic choice to make it easier to distinguish them for the sake of a movie adaptation, so at the end of it there is not much more to say than they are the same thing. Next we look at those known by the term Urukai. Here lie many that are not folk of Mordor, some are from the north from the Misty Mountains if I know anything of orcs and their kind, and here are others strange to me. Their gear is not after the manner of orcs at all. There were four goblin soldiers of greater stature, swart, slant-eyed, with thick legs and large hands. They were armed with short broad-bladed swords, not with the curved scimitars usual with orcs, and they had bows of yew, in length and shape like the bows of men. Upon their shields they bore a strange device, a small white hand in the centre of a black field. On the front of their iron helms was set an s root wrought of some white metal. Due to the movies from Peter Jackson again, the Urukai are best associated with Saruman, but he was not the one to bring these creatures into existence. It was Sauron who first tried to improve on the orc, creating a being with greater strength, greater smarts, and larger bodies, albeit still being smaller than men. Their first appearance under Sauron came around the year 2475 of the Third Age, as it was considered the first record of them came in the last years of the stewardship of Denethor I, who died in 2477. And that is not to be confused by Denethor from the time of the War of the Ring, who came about 500 years later. Despite Sauron being the first to bring Urukai into Middle Earth, it was Saruman who was considered to have made the greatest improvements to them for the purposes of war. They could withstand the light of the sun, which most orcs despise, so could therefore move faster and more efficiently than the standard orc. To add something here as well which may have confused people a little, is when we look at their actual name, Urukai. What does this really mean? Well, Uruk means orc in black speech. 
which is the language created by Sauron for those who served under him in Mordor to give them one overall language. But anyway, the other part, Hai, means folk or people. So basically, Urukai means orc folk, which I guess might confuse a few. But now, you may think that we are done here with the main entrance, but no, we have a surprise fourth contender to consider when looking at the differences, and that is the Hobgoblin. And to get our best idea on this, it is worth looking at the author's notes from The Hobbit. Orc is not an English word. It occurs in one or two places, but is usually translated goblin, or hobgoblin for the larger kinds. Orc is the hobbit's form of the name given at that time to these creatures. So the hobgoblin is a term that is not widely used, but it is what was used for the larger kinds of the orcs of Middle Earth. Again though, this term is barely used, in fact only twice, and they both come inside of The Hobbit. So although it is not really confirmed, it is fairly safe to assume that at the time of writing, Tolkien assumed that this term is what referenced the Uruks, and so was later just replaced by the name of Urukai. So now that we have covered those four versions of the evil foot soldiers of the forces of darkness, it is time to address exactly how the differences between them are more easily explained. Let's start off simple. What is the difference between an orc and a goblin? Nothing. They are the same creatures that are simply referred to by different names at different points in Tolkien's writings. And the same goes for the differences between the Urukai and the hobgoblins. So now more importantly, what are the differences between the orcs and goblins compared to the Urukai and hobgoblins? Well, as covered earlier, orcs are the original evil soldiers that came to be by Malkor corrupting elves into unrecognisable evil. They were short creatures being around the height of dwarves and hobbits, but were still considered strong. Whereas an Urukai was in general just considered an upgrade, they were taller, smarter, faster, stronger, and as well as this, one of their most important differences was the ability to withstand sunlight, albeit still not exactly liking it. So there we have it, a look at the differences between goblins, orcs, and Urukai. We have come to learn that all goblins are orcs, and all orcs are goblins. All Uruks are orcs. But as they are a breed of them, not all orcs are Uruks. I hope that makes sense to you all. Today's video is concerned with the redemption of the orc, and whether there is room for such a possibility. A note on the body of text known as the Legendarium is in order first. Tolkien spent many, many years writing and rewriting the Silmarillion, and indeed, all of the works which now comprise the Legendarium. And just to clarify to those of you who do not know what I mean, the Legendarium is the body of work Tolkien succeeded in writing in his lifetime as the background to his legendary The Lord of the Rings and Middle-earth as a whole. So this includes all sorts from the likes of The Silmarillion and even the 12 volume series of the history of Middle-earth. I realise that word can be said a lot, but many people do not fully understand its meaning. But anyway, it must be said that at the time of his death, Tolkien's final ideas and canon were not set in stone. What his thoughts were originally had obviously changed between The Hobbit, where orcs are called goblins, and The Lord of the Rings. How much work was done and how much was or would be changed, we can never truly know. Knowing Tolkien as we do though, however, the easy answer would be of course an orc could be redeemed. That is the essence of the gospel. And as much as we try not to dive deeply into the religious side of things here, it is hard to ignore with Tolkien's work. You had the thief and the scoundrel as the very people whom Christ gave his life to save. Again, we are not theologians, very far from being experts or anything like that, but understanding Professor Tolkien's faith and knowing to what extent it shaped his work, we are able to say that he would leave open the opportunity for anyone, for anything, to be saved and to redeem themselves. Turning to the text, however, there are no explicit examples of good orcs, though we do see orcs acting in ways that, with a group actually composed of humans instead, we would not doubt their salvation. For example, after the Fellowship passed through the mines of Moria, one group of orcs begin to follow them, and their reason is perhaps peculiar. 
When the riders of Rohan led by Eomir come upon the group of orcs carrying Merry and Pippin in the book, there are three groups of orcs thereabouts. One group is from Mordor, there to act on Sauron's behalf and take the ring back to their master. The second is from Isengard, to behave likewise and return the ring and the hobbits to Saruman. The third group, however, was from Moria, and they had no business with the ring. They sought the fellowship out of the desire for revenge, for vengeance for their slain chieftain, their comrade, the one felled by the fellowship before they crossed the bridge of khazad in their escape. This suggests at the very least a nobility of purpose, even of a spirit that demonstrates grief at the loss of a friend. The death of one's comrade can give way to anguish as easily as it can give way to grief. Revenge is remorse with knives a brutal but human impulse still with us now. For whom among us can say, we might not think likewise if our friend or chief were slain. We might not take up arms and hunt them down in this day and age, but we would not exactly invite them over for a cup of tea either. Maybe they just get blocked online. Hopefully you get my point. If we look at another example, when the orcs are joined by the wild men of Dunland as they ride for Hounds Deep, they are able to make common cause with the Dunlendings as the latter feel inclined and are the traditional enemies of Rohan as their homeland was overtaken hundreds of years before the War of the Ring by the ancestors of the Rohirrim. It takes some social grace and want of common ground to forge an alliance in time of war, and there is another indication that orcs are more than faceless enemies, or zombies if you wish. Aragorn even gives a company of orcs a warning to leave the battlefield lest they be cut down to a man during the Battle of the Hornbook. I have still this to say, answered Aragorn. No enemy has yet taken the Hornbook. Depart, or not one of you will be spared. Not one will be left alive to take back tidings to the north. You do not know your peril. This can be put down to the nobility of Aragorn. But we might recall as well that Gimli and Legolas are both noble too, and yet, as Eomir and Aragorn attempt to scatter the wild men and orcs who press against the gate, trying to force their entrance, some flee at the sight of a restored Anduril. Aragorn and Eomir begin to retreat, but are attacked from behind. Gimli comes along and thinks nothing of himself when he comes to their aid with his axe. And returning to Legolas then, he claims to have killed two orcs only to be dismayed that Legolas has in fact killed 20 at the least. That they make sport of killing is not an invention of Peter Jackson for the movies, it is definitely in the text. This is just moments before the explosion raises the deepened wall, opening the whole of the fortress up with the explosives provided by Saruman. Aragorn immediately leads a company of men to fight at the breach, but they cannot halt, and Aragorn and Eomir are separated from Gimli and Legolas. The point of this is to show that Aragorn has been fighting all night, and this is a highly conscientious man. It is doubtful he would spare combatants he knew to be pure evil, beyond redemption, beings who exist to be mere vessels, to act as Morgoth and Sauron's fingers as it were. If we understand their origins as we have it in the published Silmarillion, that they were once elves, captured and perverted by Morgoth to spite Eru and the Valar, their wholesale slaughter at the hands of the Fellowship now becomes morally dubious and threatens to make our heroes into killers, not necessarily the people that we want to be looking up to. When reading through his letters, we also get the sense that the term Orc and Sauron could be used to mean specific types of people. For example, with this, in writing to Christopher Tolkien in May of 1944, Tolkien writes, But England in 1917. 1918 was in a poor way, and it is a bit thicker that in a land of relative plenty you should have such conditions and the taxpayers would like to know where are all the millions going, if the pick of their sons are so treated. However it is, human beings what they are, quite inevitable, and the only cure, short of universal conversion, is not to have wars, nor planning, nor organisation, nor regimentation. Your service is, of course, as anybody with any intelligence and ears and eyes knows, a very bad one living on the repute of a few gallant men, 
and you are probably in a particularly bad coma of it. But all big things planned in a big way feel like that to the toad and to the harrow, though on a general view they do function and do their job. What we must remark on here is the allusion to Rudyard Kipling's poem of 1886. There we have the line, the toad beneath the harrow knows exactly where each tooth point goes. During Tolkien's lifetime and since, to be under the harrow was to be subjected to distress or torment. And then, when we continue in that same letter, Tolkien also says, They do function and do their job, an ultimately evil job. For we are attempting to conquer Sauron with the ring, and we shall, it seems, succeed. But the penalty is, as you will know, to breed new Saurons, and slowly turn men and elves into orcs. Not that in real life things are as clear cut as in a story, and we started out with a great many orcs, on our side. Professor Tolkien has remained adamant that no part of his work is allegorical, at least not intentionally so, though he admits there is a difference between allegory and applicability. Here we have what appears to be a specific reference to what he believed Warfare did. When you use the ring on Sauron, what he means is, you repay inhumanity with inhumanity, and evil deeds only breed more evil deeds. In the 11th volume of the History of Middle-earth, The War of the Jewels, we learn more about the evolution of Tolkien's languages from and in world perspective. In the penultimate chapter, Author's Notes to Quendi and Eldar, we learn that the elves share a word for orc, which means that when the elves first thought of orcs as demons and monsters was at a time before they were separated, when they shared a single language shortly after they awoke in Cruyvianen. The hate for orcs is so deep and ancient that the different groups, those who went to Valinor and those who remained behind, each had similar words which meant the same. For example, orc with a K is found within the earliest elvish dictionaries and is defined as demon or monster. The word comes from the root ruku, signifying the dreadful shapes taken by the servants of Malkor that haunted the elves and the terror that they inspired. In Sindarin, you have Urch or Orkoth, which shows that the notion of the Orcs as a demonic group was common among the Elves before their sundering, before their languages evolved into different tongues entirely. Or, here we get the impression that Tolkien and his son Christopher understand that to be an Orc or a Sauron means to be defined by specific traits, as he says the penalty of using the ring to conquer Sauron is the creation of another Sauron. So, they are all made into those things by events and actions, not born with no choice. In The Hobbit, words like orc and goblin are interchangeable, even still the sword of Thorin Oakenshield is named Orcrist, Goblin Cleaver, but the goblins called it simply Biter. For all our speculation, they serve a narrative purpose that is important an obstruction to our heroes who are both dangerous and frightening, but so different from us and inhuman that we feel no sorrow or guilt at their killing, as it must be, unless we see the protagonists as murderers rather than heroic in their slaughter of demons and beasts. Tolkien wrote a letter to Peter Hastings in 1954 when discussing the idea of creation by evil after Treebeard's comments about trolls that also with orcs who are fundamentally a race of rational incarnate creatures, though horribly corrupted, if no more so than many men to be met today. So there we have it. Having ended with the words from Tolkien himself, it is hard to say definitively yes or no to our subject of today. At the end of our search, we must admit that despite Tolkien's later moral wranglings over their creation, this is most likely their foremost function to the narrative, the faceless baddies who can be killed without guilt. We must admit, despite his uncertainty over the orcs and their treatment, especially as it pertains to their creation, we have no evidence from the text that there is a good orc. We do have evidence, however, that they are not irredeemable down to a man. And with the lands of Middle-earth free of the shadow that was Sauron, the Fourth Age might yet be a time when orcs make the most of a quiet, peaceful life 
and perhaps find their inner hobbit. He is hoping we might all find that cheer in the end regardless of our experiences and hardships, there and back again as a great hobbit once labelled his tale. We can only resolve to be better on the morrow than we were the day before. And that, dear friends, must be enough. So I know these subjects can sometimes be frustrating that there's not a simple yes or no answer, but I hope with everything we've gone through today, you can make up a clear thought in your own mind of how Tolkien understood his orcs, and if, in the end, if it was possible for there to be a good one. There, countless became the hosts of his beasts and his demons, and the race of the orcs, bred long before, grew and multiplied in the bowels of the earth. Now, the matter of how orcs reproduce in Tolkien's creations presents several varied explanations. Tolkien tended to alter his perspective over the years, never arriving at a singular, concrete answer before his death. So what are these diverse theories? Let us start by delving into the depths of the fall of Gondolin. How it came ever that among men the Nodoli have been confused with the orcs who are Malchus goblins, I know not unless it be that certain of the Noldoli were twisted to the evil of Malco and mingled among these orcs. For all that race were bred by Malco of the subterranean heats and slime. Their hearts were of granite and their bodies deformed. Foul their faces which smiled not, but their laugh that of the clash of metal, and to nothing were they more fain than to aid in the basest of the purposes of Malco. The greatest hatred was between them and the Noldoli, who named them Glamhoth, or folk of dreadful hate. As we can see from this, it was at one point considered by Tolkien that Morgoth created the race of orcs himself as a way to mock the elves. That must mean that they cannot or do not breed as they can almost be considered to be carved out by some greater power. With this power being continued after Morgoth by his second in command Sauron and then later by Saruman as well. However, later in life, Tolkien changed his thoughts on this idea and made it that in his world, Morgoth could not actually produce any life of his own. So that could well just take this option off the table already. What this means then, is that we go down the path of orcs being created solely by Morgoth corrupting and mutilating already living elves. So as elves breed sexually, then surely the basic form of life would not have changed that much, so that leads to orcs to breed in the same way. This meaning that there are actually both male and female orcs, just as there would have been both male and female elves. Something that backs up this theory is from the Silmarillion, where it says, And thus did Malkor breed the hideous race of the orcs in envy and mockery of the elves, of whom they were afterwards the bitterest foes. For the orcs had life and multiplied after the manner of the children of Iluvatar, and naught that had life of its own, nor the semblance of life, could ever Malkor make since his rebellion in the Ainulindale before the beginning. So surely to multiply in the manner of the children of Iluvatar means that they can only mean they were born in the same way too. A theory for the actual female orcs as well could even be that they were treated like the way that the dwarves treat the dwarven women. It's true you don't see many dwarf women, and in fact, they are so alike in voice and appearance that they're often mistaken for dwarf men. The basic idea of this would be that the orc women would not be seen by other races, as they would either not travel much, fight in battles, or really get involved in anything outside of their own race. So they would basically just stay in their homes or caves or mud pits or whatever and almost be there solely for the responsibility of breeding. Which when you think about it would not be the most unrealistic thing to think when the orcs are a race that have spawned out of just mockery and darkness. In a world where you have talking trees, dragons, fire demons, would this really be the most unrealistic aspect of Middle Earth? I don't think so. To further back this point up too, when you look at Tolkien's writings, you see that, although there are obviously women in the world, I mean you have the great ones like Eowyn, Arwen, and many more, they are very scarcely written about in the grand scheme of it all. So for orc women not to be talked about too much, again makes sense with the way that Tolkien wrote things. Or to add one more bit to this, there is a very good possibility that even if they went into wars and they did fight alongside the men, by the time you put armour on them, they very well just looked so alike to male orcs that no one would ever know the difference either way. Ah! 
What could potentially be a more awkward part of this question is when it comes to some of the dealings of crossbreeding. If we open up the pages to the Lord of the Rings for a moment, and we take a look at the quote spoken by Gambling of Rohan in the Two Towers, he says, But these creatures of Isengard, these half-orcs, and goblin men that the foul craft of Saruman has bred, they will not quail at the sun, said Gamling, and neither will the wild men of the hills. Do you not hear their voices? From this quote, Gamling is talking about the uruk -hai. But what it also shows us is how there was this dark path that Saruman was not afraid to wander down. It is considered that Saruman was the one who initiated some crossbreeding, with him forcing the Dunlendings into it. This could then obviously mean, for a not so nice thought, that he gave male orcs hill women, or hill men female orcs. Not the most pleasant thought, I will admit to that. This would give an explanation into the origins of some of his spies too, like the squint-eyed southerner that is mentioned to be seen by Frodo when in Bree during the Fellowship of the Ring. Most of them were ordinary men, rather tall and dark-haired, and grim but not particularly evil-looking. But there were some others that were horrible, man-high, but with goblin faces, salop, leering, squint-eyed. Do you know, they reminded me at once of that southerner at Bree, only he was not so obviously orc-like as most of these were. Now let's move on to another option, and again, a lot of this is a bit of me theorising, so it, you know, could be taken as a bit of a what-if kind of question. But anyway, if orcs could not or simply had no interest in breeding sexually, then another option is that they were simply just grown. This is the pathway that the legendary trilogy seemed to wander down. We see that the uruk are pulled from the mud in the movies, almost like they've been grown in a cocoon and then dug out when they're ready. But how does this work? Is it magic? Seedlings? Something like a potion recipe? What about if you plant an orc bone, give it enough water, then five more grow in its place? Okay, now yes, that one does sound a bit stupid, but technically these aren't ever ruled out as options, as much as they may be clutching at straws, it is not confirmed otherwise at the same time. You may wonder though, why is this the case? Was this subject purposely avoided, or was it just a subject that didn't seem to hold much importance to Tolkien himself? I personally think it is the case of, if we think again to one of the many changes Tolkien made in his time, we've got to remember back to the beginning, where we have that first point of how only Eru Iluvatar could create new life. None of the other Valar, not Malkor, no one else except Eru and that was something that Malkor was extremely jealous of. This power came from the Secret Fire, also known as the Flame Imperishable, and that is the same one that Gandalf says he is a servant of when he fights against the Balrog. I am a servant of the Secret Fire. So it is impossible for them to just be created as such, most likely circling back to the point of earlier, orcs are a mockery of elves, having twisted those beings from being the fair children of Iluvatar into the orcs that we all know and fear, most likely keeping their reproductive methods the same in that way. Do you think that this has helped clear things up at all for you? Well, let me add another point that may or may not add more confusion to this subject. If we take a sidestep for a moment, let's have a look at the Hobbit book. It mentions that the commander that leads the orcs is called Bolg, and Bolg is the son of Azog. He obtains Azog's position and army when his dad is slain by Dane Einfeld. So, that implies that some orc power comes down to basically a family lineage, just like humans would. But it could also be fair to think that the wording is a non-literal use of the word son, and that meaning, as Bolg was Azog's next in line as commander, they just spoke of him like a son. This is something I believe more people might lean towards, as by the time Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings, any types of sons, fathers, or children when talking about orcs have no mentioning at all. But now, one last point in this subject comes from a letter from the man himself, J.R.R. Tolkien, as he wrote to a Mrs. Munby in 1963 in response to a few questions that her son has. There must have been orc women, but in stories that seldom if ever see the orcs except as soldiers of armies in the service of the evil lords, we naturally would not learn much about their lives. Not much was known. So from Tolkien's own mouth, or hand, I guess. There must have been orc women, but not much was known, even to him.
So there we have it. This was a strange one to research and write about, and I hope it was at least interesting to listen to. In our quest to understand the breeding habits of orcs in Tolkien's expansive universe, we have ventured through various theories and texts that offer hints, but no definitive answers. From the possibility of orcs being twisted as a mockery of elves created by Morgoth, which hints at conventional reproductive methods, to the unsettling narratives of crossbreeding initiated by figures like Saruman. Either way, the theories tend to be a bit dark. Even Tolkien himself seemed to grapple with the exact nature of orc reproduction, leaving room for interpretation and further exploration. While the depiction of familial connections in orc society, as evidenced by characters like Bolgan Azog, hints at some form of lineage, it also thickens the plot in this intriguing discussion. The breeding habits of orcs in Tolkien's world have and will remain a mystery, one that invites readers to delve deeper into the rich, complex, and sometimes ambiguous world that Tolkien crafted. But these are the kind of mysteries that just lead us all to be massive fans of Tolkien's work and keeps his world going strong after all of these years. So as we know it, Mount Gundabad is an Orc Mountain stronghold based in the northern end of the Misty Mountains, but it was not always occupied by Orcs. The earliest information we have on Mount Gundabad goes all the way back before the Dwarves, before even the Elves. Aule had created Durin the First, also known as Durin the Deathless. He was set to sleep alone beneath Mount Gundabad in Middle-earth until the Elves awoke. He then awoke during the Years of the Trees. But because he awoke there alone, he did not stay. He walked south until he founded khazad Doom, also known as Moria, and the Line of Durin, the most famous line of all Dwarves. Mount Gundabad remained a special and sacred place to the dwarves even after their awakening. Although dwarves never really made any sort of permanent long-term residence in Gundabad, it had been used mainly as a place of assembly and delegation of dwarves. That is pretty much all the information that Tolkien ever gave us about Gundabad during its time as a dwarven mountain, but interestingly, it's actually Gundabad's fall to orcs that began an age of ongoing hatred between the dwarves and the orcs. The second had been Mount Gundabad, which was therefore revered by the Dwarves, and its occupation in the Third Age by the Orcs of Sauron was one of the chief reasons for their great hatred of the Orcs. But getting slightly ahead there, let's go back to the year 1695 of the Second Age, when Sauron had invaded Eriador. In 1697, he had conquered Eregion, and it was already looking likely that he would overwhelm Elrond. But he was attacked from the rear by Dwarven forces sent from khazad Doom. Sauron's forces drove the dwarves back but could not breach the doors of Durin. This angered Sauron, and in his frustration, he ordered that any and all dwarves that could be found be killed. With this came the first attack of Gundabad. An army of orcs led by servants of Sauron invaded Mount Gundabad and drove the long-bearded dwarves away from their sacred holy site. As a result of this, the Grey Mountains were infested with orcs and communication between khazad Doom and the Iron Hills was cut off. This was followed by a long occupation there by orcs. Then fast forward in again to the Third Age when Angmar rose to power and its lands spread to both sides of the Misty Mountains, technically making Mount Gundabad a part of its domain. However, after the fall of Angmar in 1975, it remained populated solely by orcs. The next key point in Gundabad's history would be when the dwarves were seeking revenge for the death of Thror. All seven houses of the dwarves were rallied and they went on a war campaign that lasted six years, starting in the far north and working their way down. It can be assumed that they started their attacks in Gundabad, however they would have likely slaughtered whatever orcs they could find and then just continued south down the Misty Mountains on their vengeful rampage. This of course once again left Mount Gundabad unoccupied, meaning that at some point, either during or after this campaign, the orcs from surrounding areas could just make their way back there and reclaim it as their stronghold. It was from here that the great goblin horde present at the Battle of Five Armies attacked and marched from. Their leader, Bolg, son of Azog, was the supreme commander of the orcs from Gundabad, and presumably the northern Misty Mountains. Although they lost a huge amount of their numbers in this battle, Mount Gundabad still belonged to the orcs right up until the end of the Third Age, though they were at an extremely reduced state, which is why I find it kind of strange that it was never actually reclaimed by the dwarves, though it can be assumed that that was the case after the War of the Ring. <laughs> 
Now on to the question at hand. Are the Gundabad Orcs more powerful than regular Orcs? Or even Urukai? Well, yes. Potentially. Let's look at this passage from the Hobbit book. Then they marched and gathered by hill and valley, going ever by tunnel or under dark, until around and beneath the great mountain of Gundabad of the north, where was their capital. So from this we can see that Gundabad was in fact the capital for the orcs from the north, and seeing as sheer size and strength was the deciding factor for the hierarchy of power among the orcs, it's a fair assumption to make that the strongest and most fierce among them would gravitate towards Gundabad. Not only that, but with the dark magical residue, so to speak, left over by the presence of Sauron and the Witch King, Gundabad would likely breed bigger and stronger orcs, just like a damp moldy cupboard would breed bigger and grosser cockroaches. So with the biggest and baddest orcs moving to Gundabad and then the process of natural selection and breeding, the offspring there would more than likely end up the most formidable of orcs. Maybe perhaps apart from a select line of let's say premium orcs in Mordor. So are Gundabad orcs more powerful? Yes, more than likely. They were bred from those that were able to win power and influence within the mountain, then strength bred strength, eventually producing the nastiest and most war-ready orcs. So that's it guys, what do you think of Gundabad orcs and their representation in the Hobbit movies? In my honest opinion, their design is one of the cooler things in the trilogy. What let them down was the fact that they were all CGI. If they had been live action with a good use of makeup and prosthetics, then they would have been extremely intimidating. So the orcs were, of course, the main servants in Sauron's armies. Their strength didn't necessarily come from their martial ability, but just from sheer numbers. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how strong or formidable you are, if your army is outnumbered 5 to 1 or possibly even more, you don't stand much of a chance. Well, most of the time. Orcs were created by the first Dark Lord Morgoth, before the First Age and served him and his later successor in their quest to dominate Middle-earth. Tolkien Gateway states that Melkor was the first to learn of the awakening of the elves. He soon began sending evil spirits among the elves who planted seeds of doubt against the Valar. It's also rumoured that some of the elves were being captured by a rider if they strayed too far and the elves later believed these were brought to Atumno, where they were cruelly tortured and twisted into orcs. Then after Morgoth's defeat, the orcs along with the other fallen Maia and servants of the Dark Lord delved deep into the caves, pits and tunnels of Middle-earth and the underground fortress of Atumno and Angband. They multiplied over thousands of years and spread throughout Middle-earth. When they first resurfaced, they were only a small problem, but when Morgoth made his return, he rallied them all under his name and unleashed them on Beleriand. They were used in many wars over the next few thousand years, but they were almost all wiped out in the War of Wrath. But those that did survive fled east towards the mountains of Angmar and other surrounding areas. Then moving forward a bit, sometime around the year 1000 of the Second Age, Sauron reappeared in Middle-earth and made the land of Mordor his realm and then he started to build the foundations of Barad-dûr. During the War of the Elves and Sauron in the Second Age, around 1700, the orcs formed the main host of Sauron's power. Now despite the immeasurable number of orcs present, the battle was won by the Elves and the Numenorians due to their united force and numbers. Until Sauron's final downfall in the Third Age, orcs remained the backbone of the armies of Mordor. But after the second Dark Lord's downfall, they were killed in large numbers at the Black Gates and slain nearly to the last orc by the men of the West in the period after the Great Victory. The captains bowed their heads, and when they looked up again, behold, their enemies were flying and the power of Mordor was scattering like dust in the wind. As when death smites the swollen brooding thing that inhabits their crawling hill and holds them all in sway, ants will wander witless and purposeless and then feebly die. So the creatures of Sauron, orc or troll or beast spell enslaved, ran hither and thither mindless, and some slew themselves or cast themselves in pits, or fled wailing back to hide in holes and dark lightless places far from hope. But the men of Rune and of Harad, Easterling and Southron, saw the ruin of their way and the great majesty and glory of the captains of the West. And those that were deepest and longest in evil servitude hated the West, and yet were proud and bold, in their turn now gathered themselves for a last stand of desperate battle. But the most part fled eastward as they could, 
and some cast their weapons down and sued for mercy. In other parts of Middle-earth, however, such as the Misty Mountains, the orcs were not nearly so dependent on Sauron, and it can be assumed that the majority of the orcs that survived the battles before Erebor at the end of the Third Age would have survived. We know that as a race they reproduce in the same way that men and elves do, and we know that they were originally bred, not really continuously created as such, by Morgoth, then were most likely bred on an industrial scale in Mordor by Sauron, but elsewhere they were self-sustaining and pretty much self-governing. In the early years of the Fourth Age, men, dwarves and elves would probably have massacred the orcs as part of a peace-seeking policy, but it's very likely that within a generation of men, let's say around 20 to 50 years, this slaughtering would have come to an end and the surviving orcs would have just been left to their own devices in the most remote mountains of Middle-earth, where they could survive underground with little need to interact with others. At the end of the day, without their huge numbers, they're not really that much of a threat. Then during Aragorn's reign as king, he conquered the lands of Harad and Cand along with the lands around Lake Rune, adding them all to the reunited kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor. He eventually chose to give the lands around Lake Nurnan in the south of Mordor to the formerly enslaved men of Mordor and possibly the surrounding orcs, letting that be their homeland and just leaving them be. As for the plains of Gorgoroth itself, it was so badly polluted by Sauron that it was completely uninhabitable and an area pretty much incapable of housing life anyway. Not only that, but the remaining effects from a volcano eruption would have had a long-lasting impact on the area. Aragorn's time as king is the turning point for Middle-earth. Multiple ancient races gave way for men to take over. Thus the orcs were confined to certain lands and forbidden from spreading out. This continued until they eventually became no more. Just as with all other magical creatures in Middle-earth, those that were left just eventually faded away. <laughs>